This is a production of Cornell University. Every fall, students in Cornell University's Restoration Ecology course take on a real-world project in the local community, working together to gather data, analyze the issues, and report their findings. In 2011, the students examined plans to dredge Cayuga Inlet, where it's estimated that more than 600,000 cubic yards of sediment have accumulated in the flood control channel at the southern end of Cayuga Lake. This is what that sediment would look like piled at the university's Sholkoff Field. The central issue, according to course instructor Dr. Thomas Whitlow, is what to do with the sediment after it's dredged. Whitlow says, the farther you move it, the more expensive it gets. But from the perspective of restoration ecology, we're not viewing the sediment as a waste product. We're treating it as a resource that can be used to maintain or improve ecosystem services locally. On December 1, 2011, Whitlow's class presented their findings at a public meeting sponsored by the Tompkins County Environmental Management Council at the Tompkins County Public Library. We joined the Management Council's Brian Eden during his introduction. And exchange ideas, and I'm sure we'll be better for it in, in the end because uh, I've been involved with a few other uh, programs that brought students and, and downtown folks together, and they've been highly productive. So, you know, if you surveyed the people in the community what the priorities for a Cuga Inlet would be, they would suggest uh, navigation for recreational boating, flooding prevention, waterfront development, tourism, competitive rowing, ecosystem enhancements would be far down the list if they were on the list at all. And I'm happy to see a lot of folks here because I know there are people in the community that are interested in that and uh, hopefully we can use that energy to maybe do something uh, positive in the future. Um, as you can see uh, from the maps and uh, the uh, photos that we have 200 years of general downward trends in the ecosystem in the uh, Cayuga Inlet. And uh, the only way to really reverse that is not to have a freestanding uh, funding uh, for, for ecosystem enhancements. They have to be combined with the dredging program. It has to be integrated on a regular basis. Uh, otherwise, we won't be able to, uh, to really be able to change this, this trend that's been going on for such a long period of time. So, uh, you know, a, a number of EMC folks uh, uh, got together this summer. We've been talking about these issues. Everyone knows that we've been losing a lot of wetlands in the vicinity, a lot of, uh, you know, build out development in the uh, Elmire Road area. You know, they're talking about increased development on Inlet Island. There's a lot of economic pressure on the city to, to generate uh, income and increase the tax base, so that's, that's understandable, but these all come with costs to the ecosystem. So anyway, we met with Tom, uh, Tom Whitlow, and, uh, and we did some walking around the inlet in Southwest uh, Park, and, uh, you know, and, and he thought maybe there was something there that would interest his students in this fall uh, ecology class, so uh, you know, he's gone ahead and I'm really uh, interested in seeing what, what has been generated from all this energy. And uh, so anyway, Tom, uh, is, Tom Whitlow is an associate professor of horticulture and he's a plant ecologist and he has a re fall restoration ecology class and, and uh, let's get on with the show. Great. Thanks very much, Brian. Hey. Hello. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> so. I'm as excited as Brian is to see what the class is going to present tonight. This is uh, an, an engine that once you start it, it uh, takes on a life of its own. And I always look back at the, the class from 1999 and early on every fall semester I think, oh geez, this class isn't halfway as good as the class from 99 was. But Every year, the classes have always managed to eclipse that performance. So uh, thank you all for coming tonight. I encourage you all to go over to the State Theater after this. You can have two hours to make comments after we get out at 9 o'clock. Uh, so please head over there and hold your questions until the end. But do we will have a question and answer period at the end. So I'll turn this over to Ben Hedstrom.
Thanks for coming. It's a very encouraging to see a full room. I see they've been sending the overflow over from the uh, fracking event, like we asked. So <laughs> appreciate you stepping over. Um, I speak for our entire class when I say that um, it's definitely been a great opportunity to take on this issue. I know we've learned a ton this semester. and Looking forward to sharing that with you this evening. Um, it's always important and very um, enriching as a student to take on events that, um, and topics that have real impact in the community and are real events. So I hope that that comes across tonight and uh, let's get started. So tonight we're going to present our findings about the Cayuga Inlet dredge materials and opportunities for beneficial reuse. And starting off tonight is Rebecca Montrose. Thanks, Ben. Okay. Hi. Thanks again for coming, everybody. Um, as you've been informed, this is the Restoration Ecology class of fall 2011. Here we are on a field trip that we took down to the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland this fall. Happy bunch there. The goals of tonight's presentation is to summarize some findings from our class, um, provide the community with some information pertinent to the dredging project, and um, sort of an unexpected twist has been to add to the body of knowledge related to this aquatic, aquatic invasive plant, um, Hydrilla verticillata. And so I'm going to be introducing the project, then we'll be talking about the watershed and history, um, looking at the properties of the dredge material itself, some studies that we did regarding the release of methane gas, um, more information about Hydrilla, and then some reference sites that we visited and looked at and some alternatives that we've been coming up with. Um, so as many of you are probably aware, this landscape in our region um, is defined by a long um, process of accretion of sediment and deposition of material from retreating glaciers. And you, we're going to hear more about that in the watershed section. Um, and also the area at the south part of Cayuga Lake has also um, historically been marshland and the water would travel through this marshy area before entering the lake. Um, this has been altered of course and leaves us where we are today with um, some more severe flooding instances and the need to manage and maintain the inlet through the process of dredging. Um, this slide is just demonstrating um, the flood control channel which was built from 1962 to 1970, um, which was very important course for um, protecting our uh, west part of town and downtown area, um, but of course creates another um, maintenance question in terms of dredging, which is on the table now. So this um, again might seem quite obvious, but um, sediment collects in the inlets from various tributaries. Um, as Brian Eden said, it impedes water recreation and navigability, um, but it has also affected um, the ecosystem health. And um, removing the sediment increases our ability to control floods. There has been deferred maintenance um, in the past 30 years or so, and, um, which leads to need for quite drastic measures. Um, brief run through of dredging process. The dredge is the machine itself which does this operation. There are hydraulic dredges um, which vacuum suck the material out from the, from the bottom, mixes it with water to create a slurry. And there are mechanical dredges which just physically scoop the material out. Um, in our case, most of the dredging will be done with one of these hydraulic dredges and then pumped um, through pipes to the southwest park. Um, 
in the Cascadilla Creek area, some of it may be done with a mechanical dredge. And that is only the first part of the process. Secondly, the material is dewatered um, for six months to a year. And extensive time, resources, and land are required for this process. And finally, what we've been starting to think about in this class is um, a third step, which is to move or reuse this material in a, a way that's beneficial to the community. Um, one example that people are familiar with, perhaps, is the 1999 lake source cooling dredging study, um, for which 3,000 cubic yards of material was removed. And again, you can see this three, in this case, four-step process of dredging, dewatering, and brought, in this case, to a disposal site in Dryden, which we visited with the class and have done some analysis on the material there. And again, there's our other dredging, uh, just to hit home that uh, this has, is a long-standing tradition in the community. It's um, inevitable and necessary um, part of living in this area. Um, which brings us to the current plan for dredging of the Cuyuga Inlet. These are some of the project partners that we've outlined here. So as you can see here, the environmental impact statement has just been released on this project and we encourage everyone to check that out at ithacadredging.com and to attend the hearing, public hearing on December 12th at City Hall. Um, so our presentation is going to talk about the qualities of this dredge material and speak to this larger question of how the material could or will be used. Um, the numbers that we've been working with have been within a range, but the maximum that we are operating under the assumption is that we could have 660,000 cubic yards, um, which is significant. And the current plan, um, as I mentioned, would be to bring this material to a site behind the parking lot in, uh, by, of Lowe's. Southwest, Southwest Park, which is about 20 acres. Um, just sort of some imagery, <laughs> 660,000 cubic yards of this material would fill 25,000 dump trucks, which lined up would take you Scranton. Um, and in our case, the material will be um, pumped as a slurry to the site but eventually, when it's moved, it will be taken in trucks. And so the carbon footprint is also a concern, of course. This is a lot of movement, a lot of transit. Um, this graphic is also just <laughs> sort of get point across that um, this is a lot of dredge material. <laughs> this is on uh, the football field at Cornell. And then, um, really important to our project is analyzing this aquatic invasive plant, which is now um, been found extensively in the south um, edge of the park. And um, the inlet, as you may know, was closed to boat traffic in September, and then in October um, it was treated. And um, we've been looking at some options um, for how we can conscientiously um, continue with the dredging project um, without exacerbating this problem. Um, just as a general framework for our class, we've always been thinking about uh, three um, approaches to restoration ecology. Um, and this again is, as Brian Eden mentioned, many, many people think of ecosystem services, natural processes that are typically defined as beneficial to human use. But ecosystem function, the, the processes of a healthy ecosystem um, in their own right are very important, as well as habitat restoration. So thinking about these as habitats for um, plant and animal species. And now I'm going to 
turn it over to Matthew Gonzo. Sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Rebecca. Um, as we all know, you know the, the inlet itself is the focus of the project and the dredging operations, but understanding the hydrologic and the geologic settings around it, you need to take a step back, in this case a much larger step back, and understand the watershed processes at play. Um, a watershed has a lot of different components at different scales. Uh, you can see here this is Cayuga Lake and the two reservoirs and Six Mile Creek. Um, just another image of, of the 60-foot dam. But also within our, our gorges and our channel systems are the sediments themselves, either uh, base sediments in the, at the bottom of the channel or the walls of the, the gorges themselves. In our case, we have four sub-watersheds that are contributing to the southern Cayuga Lake Inlet complex. Cayuga Inlet itself is the largest, and that includes the area that drains from uh, Treeman State Park. Buttermilk Creek is the smallest in area and includes Buttermilk Falls State Park. Six Mile Creek watershed is the largest and includes the city's drinking supply, and Cascadilla Creek is the second smallest in area. Um, both Cascadilla Creek and Six Mile Creek have some channelized portions through downtown. And just for reference, Cascadilla Creek is the creek that outlets right at the farmer's market. So understanding where the water's coming, the other question could be, where's the sediment coming? Um, and as we, Rebecca alluded to previously, we have this geologic history and this geologic legacy of erosion and sedimentation that is obviously something that's likely out of our hands. Um, another historical legacy that contemporary uh, times must be aware of and, and have to deal with is this idea of legacy sediments, which is usually the result of human land use practices um, generally attributed to um, clearing fields for agricultural purposes, um, removing forest cover, which then disrupts the soil and all the other agricultural practices of tilling the soil. It, it stirs up the, the, set the soil, um, increasing erosion, erosion upland of a floodplain and then bringing that soil, which would generally be held by the forest cover, um, in those upland settings. But once in the floodplain, it has the potential to obviously get into the flood, um, the streams and the channels and the different contributors throughout a hydrologic uh, system. It's not always necessarily coming, rushing down through our gorges and channels, but it's obviously increased the amount of sediment within, or I would say aggravated the natural geologic erosion and added a little bit extra to the sedimentation process. Uh, just again to talk about legacy sediments, we have a, a study that discusses 200 years of forest cover changes in our region. Um, you can see here with a baseline at 1970 of, of say 100% in that just about 100, uh, just over 100 year period, which we would call the period of legacy sediment development, you have this removal of a lot of the forest cover in the area, um, which then aggravates the erosion and contributes to the, the sedimentation within the streams and ultimately the lake system, which is an accreting system. Um, just to, to again demonstrate where the erosion, the, where the sediment is coming from, uh, our class went out um, just after the storms, Irene and Lee, and observed over on Banks Road up Six Mile Creek a large washout of the road. Uh, if you were to look at an aerial image of this um, previous to the event, the stream channel bank is probably about 40 to 50 feet more. Uh, into the stream itself. So you have these, these large rain events which with the geology of our area is, is going to erode and, and normally does erode and that's the geologic legacy that we're uh, dealing with. So it's understanding that we're operating within an accreting system, um, both aggravated slightly by human activity but mostly this geologic processes. A study done in the early 2000s by the Intermunicipal Organization, uh, I believe it's called the Kiga Lake Intermunicipal Watershed Organization, 
looked at these subwater, uh, actually looked at the entire Cayuga Lake basin, uh, and I focused in down at the south end of the lake for our purposes, but they categorized the different subwatersheds looking at their erosive capacities. Um, and this actually corresponds with another model that was generated by some environmental engineers at Cornell in the late 80s looking at trying to quantify non-point sources of pollutants within the system and sediment itself is a non-point pollutant um, and their numbers as you can see here Cayuga Inlet was categorized as very severe this red color corresponds with the model itself and these numbers are not kilograms per hectare per year a number which will come up again uh, towards the end of my section. We had taken, we'd been given this information actually, a lot of common knowledge was saying that, that the sedimentation is, is this um, in-stream erosion and there's probably nothing you can really do about it. We tried to conduct one more study just to look at landslide susceptibility, adapting a U.S. geological survey and a New York State geological survey model for landslide susceptibility using various soil components and, and slopes, um, getting an idea of areas that are potentially more likely to have some sort of landslide. Uh, actually, more accurately, it's called a, a mass wasting event, um, as demonstrated probably by that, the previous image of the road outwash. Um, as would be expected, a lot of our severe, our areas of, of high hazard are the incised gorges throughout the hydrologic system, but susceptibility obviously doesn't necessarily mean that, that there is erosion. Um, thinking back again about that comment concerning legacy sediments and, and the period of deforestation, like much of upstate New York, um, the southern Cayuga Lake area has experienced reforestation within the last half century with estimates that it's about 55 to 60 percent of that original baseline value. So even though we may have some areas that are susceptible per se, um, it doesn't always equate to contributions to this um, erosion and sedimentation process. Lastly, what does this all actually mean? Uh, we had those model numbers which showed the contributions on a kilogram per hectare per year on a, the, the four sub-watersheds. We had this number possibly 660 to 670,000 cubic yards of dredged material that they're considering uh, necessary for the project. And we have this understanding of some sort of mass balance of sedimentation as a continuous natural process versus us trying to remove it and extract it. So this in versus out over time really becomes a maintenance issue and a maintenance regime. And having an understanding of the inputs and outputs, obviously this potential contribution is not all going to be deposited within the inlet system. You can see here in this image of a 1993 storm, a large sediment plume uh, actually reaching the lake. The lake is an accreting system. This is the natural flow for sediments towards the north end of the lake. But knowing the ins and outs and considering some sort of balance over time is really uh, the bigger question. We have this, this issue of deferred maintenance. Um, for example, if Southwest Park can only handle 80,000 cubic yards per year and we're removing you know, 80,000 per year of the 670,000 and we have this some number, some volume of sedimentation within the inlet, you're not necessarily having this net value of 80,000 each year. Um, that's, that shouldn't be discouraging though because again, the lake itself is an accreting system. It's a natural process, um, partly aggravated by these legacy sediments. But something, a motto that our class has tried to adopt is not calling dredge material spoils, which is sort of the general consensus, but this erosive, these erosive forces generating the sediments, this is parent material, uh, soil in the making perhaps, and it is an opportunity knowing these ins and outs for beneficial reuses and having an actual long-term management and then, sorry, long-term maintenance being the dredging and then a management routine, which is the use of the dredge, dredged material for some purpose thereafter. But obviously before you can do anything with the materials, you have to know its biologic, physical, and chemical compositions, and that's what the next section will discuss. Hayden? Thank you.
Matt. So as Matt said, we are dealing with a lot of dredge material um, being removed during this process. Um, so we took a few samples from a couple different sites. Originally, we were planning on using doing all the tests on the Cayuga Inlet, but as many of you know, there's an invasion invasion of hydrilla. So we were unable to get our boats out on the inlet. So we chose the next best thing, which is the Six Mile Creek Reservoir, and we chose this because, assumably, these are the sediments that will be making their way down to the inlet. Um, so we had three different um, transects that we took. It was kind of left, center, and right. Um, and we chose a few choice samples from these um, samples that we took. Um, and we were trying to find out what are the characteristics of the dredge material and can this material sustain plant life? Because if we found that it could sustain plant life, it kind of opens up a whole new world of opportunities for us to use this material in another way rather than um, just putting it on a site such as this. So this is the, uh, another sample site that we had and it was the, uh, the dredge material disposal site for the uh, lake source cooling that Cornell conducted. And we again had, we took um, samples from the non-dredge material, which is actually over here, where they, Cornell had not dumped any dredge, and took samples from where they had dumped the dredge material over here. Um, and this gave us an opportunity to see whether or not there are persistent long-term effects um, and differences in the soil characteristics of dredge material or what you find in your typical field around uh, Tompkins County. One of the ways that we measured this was to um, take uh, rare, rare faction curves of uh, plant speciation. So we started off by counting the number of species that we found here, and we would make the um, area that we were counting bigger and bigger, and we would count the number of new species that we found. Um, and what we found was that uh, as, you, as, your area, as your area got bigger, the rate of uh, finding new species actually decreased. So you're still finding a lot of new species, but less and less as you got larger. And what we found actually was that in the dredge material, which is in red, you have a higher number of different species than in the non-dredge material. And upon further examination, we found that um, the two sites only shared 52% of the same species. So they're actually very different species growing in these um, sites that are in close vicinity. So here are the similar species, and all the ones in red are invasive or uh, non-native plant species. Um, so these, in the, old, in the old field site, these are plants that are growing there. And in the sediment soil, these are either plants that had just found their way in there or were actually um, residents in the seed bank um, from whenever they had deposited on the bottom of Cape Lake and were then introduced into the site. So that could explain why there's so many different um, plant species. Or it could just be that fact that there's very, the, soil, or the soils are consistent of very different things. Um, this is just a couple of pictures of us doing the actual sampling. We used an Ekman dredge down here to uh, collect our samples in the Cayuga Inlet in the reservoir. Um, and that's us in the lab. So we used the Cornell Nutrient Analysis Lab and conducted the soil health test, which is available to the public. Um, we had a lot of help from Bob Schindelbeck and um, everyone else in the health lab. And we tested the physical, biological, and chemical natures of the dredge material to kind of figure out what is this stuff made of um, and what, what can we really do with it. And here we have the, the results for the nutrients in the dredge material. And we found that in the reservoir, the Six, six Mile Creek Reservoir, the aggregate stability was actually much lower than the control site or the dredge site. So that means that if we were to use it for something, we would have to um, either mix it with organic matter or something else to make this stuff kind of stick together more, because as of now, it's kind of like a, a kind of goop if you put it on the ground. So that wouldn't work very well. And if we were to dispose that anywhere, it would kind of make its way back in the inlet, which would defeat the purpose of the project. The organic matter, um, this is one of our surprise findings. The kind of consensus before this project was that we would have zero organic matter. They thought it was just kind of like a clay soil with nothing else in it. It's actually at 2%, which is fairly high. You want to be at around 5% for a very usable soil. And the control site was only about 6.4. So we actually found a decent amount of uh, organic matter. The pH was a little bit higher than the control site, but that actually help, will help to uh, stabilize some of the other um, nutrients that we have very high rates of. So um, in the background you can see this is kind of a, a pH scale on the bottom, and as you move up the scale, a lot, some of these nutrients, it's harder for plants to take them up. So one of them is iron right here. And as you can see, we have much higher rates of iron 
um, in the field or in the reservoir as in the control site. So iron, um, manganese, zinc, and aluminum, their uptake by plants is all inhibited by a high pH. So even though we have high levels of these nutrients in the sediment that we collected from the reservoir, their uptake is actually buffered by the fact that we have a higher pH. And also, as you can see, we have kind of ridiculous numbers of uh, uh, rates of calcium in here and magnesium. Uh, magnesium about double calcium is like like a hundred times or something. Um, but calc magnesium, if it's if it's found in this high rate, could actually be um, harmful to plants. But calcium acts as a buffer to prevent the uptake of magnesium into plants. And both of them are natural ne uh, necessary nutrients for plants. But the fact that you have such high rates of both actually kind of stabilizes the soil, which means that it still could be a usable um, soil. So that actually, it's, it was interesting to find that they all kind of balance each other out, and even though we have very funky numbers, it's still a, a possibly very usable soil. Another thing that we found, or what that we expected was that this would be very clay, very fine material, and that there wouldn't be much else in there. That would be, just be a very a solid clay mixture. But we actually found that we have more toward a silt loam, which is much better, so it's a, it makes it usable for a lot of other things. Um, so as you can see, the inlet is a... Uh, yeah, it's a sandy loam. Uh, the reservoir was a silt loam. The dredge uh, material on the site was a loam, and the non-dredge was a silt loam. So actually, the non-dredge material was actually more silty clay than, the, um, than what we found in the inlet. Uh, Ecologic had done a test to look for rates of copper, lead, PAHs, and PCBs in the inlet. And what they found was that most of the uh, samples they took fell within the class A soil classification. However, you had some hot spots, which are here, here, and here, out of all the red um, sample sites. And what they found is that there, you had higher levels of lead, copper, um, only two class B pHs and one class B PCB. Um, and this, however, if we were to mix this uh, material with some sort of organic matter to increase the volume, that would um, dilute the amount of uh, metals we have in the soil, which would actually could make it approach a class A. Um, and these hot spots would then also be mixed in with all these other areas. So that would also act to dilute um, the hot spots and make them more toward a class A. And if you use um, organic material and mix it in with there, it actually um, will bind with a lot of these metals and make it biologically unavailable. So that was a very, um, even though you do have some high numbers, there's a very real possibility of being able to ameliorate this um, material and make it very usable. So the lessons that we learned from the soil tests, the nutrients found in the dredge material are high in some cases, but self-stabilizing. Um, it has low organic matter, which is better than what we thought, which is going to be none. And it also has high pH levels, which act also to stabilize some of these nutrients. The sediment is not clay, but is in fact a sandy loam. Um, and the dredge material does have the ability to sustain plant life. Um, also, the aggregate stability of the dredge was kind of the most concerning thing we found. Um, so it, is, it could it would be hard to use it as a structural material, but there are many ways that we could um, improve this and make it usable for many different things. So now I will hand this off to Nadia, and she will talk about the methane analysis that we did. So in addition to the uh, physical properties of the, so of the dredge material, we were interested in some of the biological properties. And one of these is the microbial community. Soils and sediments in general are home to a diverse microbial community. In anaerobic or low oxygen environments, microbial communities are dominated by methane producing bacteria which consume organic matter such as dead leaves and respire CH4. And Key to this project, dredging anaerobic inlet sediments could release methane that was produced by these bacteria. Um, there could be an, in an initial release um, of the methane that was already in the sediments, and if anaerobic conditions persisted, those bacteria might continue to produce methane during dewatering. So to figure out how much, oh, why do we care about this? Well, we care about this because, as you've probably heard from the fracking debate, um, Methane is a greenhouse gas. It's one of the most significant greenhouse gases after carbon dioxide. Um, and most anthropogenic methane comes from agriculture and other changes in land use. 
Um, so if we can, if methane production is significant, that would increase the carbon footprint of this project. So to find out how much methane might be produced, um, when we finally did make it out onto the inlet, we collected some samples. We were, we were aiming for a sample on a number of transects um, from on the east, west, east and west banks and the center of the channel. So samples here, samples here, there, and there. The lake is this way. Um, when we got back to the lab, we evacuated the oxygen in the jars that we collected these samples in um, to create an anaerobic environment and then measured the methane concentration over a period of approximately a month. Um, so about every, every week to every half week, we would draw off a sample of the methane and, um, and run it through a, a gas chromatograph to see how much methane had been produced. So here are the samples that um, showed appreciable methane production. Most of them were, on, were from samples taken from the banks. So numbers ranged from in the hundreds to, uh, fr from in the hundred uh, micromoles to about 3,500 micromoles. And you can see these are starting to taper off. These are starting to taper off as are these. This one already peaked. Only this one is still going up. So what this indicates is that um, what this indicates um, is, is that methane production uh, continues for about two weeks before it starts to run out of food in some samples, but in possibly high carbon um, sediments, methane production might continue, and possibly at relatively high levels. These are the samples, all the samples from the center of channels, which is where most of the dredging would take place. And it's good news, because most of them produce very little methane. It's only a single hotspot, 5C, that produced um, more methane. And that hot spot is right here, near the Buffalo Street Bridge. Um, one thing that might be contributing to this is the forested area upstream right here, where overhanging vegetation drops organic carbon into the water, where it is then incorporated into the sediment, providing food for um, methanogenic bacteria. Um, and most of the low, most of the low activity that, um, samples were in the flood control channel and getting down into the inlet. Now, how much methane does this sum up to over the whole project? <laughs> um, if we go with a lower dredging number um, and assume the highest methane production that we saw, it sums to about um, 4,500 kilograms of methane, which is about equal to the production of 45 cows in one year. Um, if we go with the lower number that we saw in the, um, in the flood control channel and the inlet itself, um, that's just one cow over the whole project. If we go with the higher, um, with the higher dredge volume, which is also the more likely dredge volume and the highest methane production, um, you get a methane output equivalent to 303 cows in one year, um, or ab about 30,000 kilograms. And um, for the lower um, methane production, that's seven cows. So what options for mitigation might we consider incorporating into the plan for dredging and dewatering? Um, one option would be to promote oxygenated conditions during dewater, dewatering to hasten the transition from an anaerobic or CH4 producing to an aerobic or uh, CO2 producing uh, microbial community. So one way to do that would be to have a thin sediment layer rather than a very thick one because oxygen gets into sediment through diffusion. So down here, very little, because the oxygen is in the water up here, 
um, it, you'll have higher oxygen concentration in the sediment up here and much, much lower concentration in the sediment down here. So if you just have this layer of sediment, you'll have higher oxygen concentrations. Um, the other option would be to, to artificially promote the, um, to, to artificially deepen the depth at which oxygen can penetrate. Um, either by mixing it in some way or by um, having channels that carry the oxygen downwards. And you could do that, you could do either of those things um, through mechanical means, physically mixing it, um, or through biological means, like having worms which produce burrows, um, and worms or roots, that sort of thing. Um, however, this would do nothing about the initial release of methane when you brought the sediment up um, from the bottom of the inlet. Uh, one option which would, do, which would do something about that but wouldn't prevent methane release in the future is methane capture. Um, this has been done on landfills and a variety of biological composting facilities. Um, the idea is that you, you use the methane as a resource, um, capture it, and then burn it for fuel, and that's not as bad as just releasing the methane directly because methane is a more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Because the, the amount of methane released by our dredge material is relatively low even over the whole scale of the project, this probably is not economically viable. A third option might just be to do nothing. Um, when you consider the whole time scale of the project, if it were spread out over, say, 10 years, in the worst case, that's like having a herd of 30 cows for 10 years. It's, while our, while our survey of methane production in the inlet was pretty rudimentary and further studies would be necessary, um, doing nothing and maybe um, buying some carbon offsets or something like that could be a viable option, um, especially because this there are probably far more important problems to solve on this project, which Peter is going to talk about. Thank you, Nadia. So, I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, have seen the hydrilla that have inhibited the uh, Kaiga Inlet area, and it's really noticeable in areas like the farmer's market. So, I'll be introducing to you tonight what the hydrilla exactly is, what its impacts and conditions in Ithaca right now are, and then I'll introduce and discuss a base, some basic experiments that we carried out with hydrilla desiccation. And then I'll talk a little bit more about potential management plans and management methods for the hydrilla as it relates to our dredging project. If you look at the map here, it shows the present condition of hydrilla. It's, the map's a little bit old. It was in August 29th, 2011. And you can see the white purple rings here. These are areas of dense hydrilla uh, <coughs> infestations, and the purple circles show rooted fragments that are present in the area but aren't, haven't taken really into a population yet. Now, they have spread out a little bit, and there are more hydrilla in the upper regions of the uh, inlet as well. Now, so you can really see that it's focused along the inlet area, and much of the infested area of hydrilla coincides with the dredging area as well especially areas like Cascadilla Creek here is, areas, is an area that the city is in charge of dredging, so separate management plans for hydrilla and dredging that, that the city comes up might be a viable option to consider as well. Some literature suggests that increased water turbidity can potentially decrease the hydrilla population. The basic concept is that with less light, the hydrilla will not be able to grow as much. Now, if we take a look at some of the light extinction curves that we carried, uh, uh, looked at using Secchi disks in the inlet area, it shows that at water depths of basically three or four feet deep, the light intensity will go down so low that it will basically reach zero. What this number basically means is we have something called the light compensation point. And the light compensation point is a point at which aquatic species respiration and photosynthesis rates will equal each other. So they will be able to reproduce once uh, they hit that certain light uh, compensation point. With hydrilla, the light compensation point is 15 micromoles 
per meter squared per second. And as you can see, basically at three and four feet deep, you have the black compensation points being reached, it's with the exception of the Cascadella Creek Road docks. But if you go back to the maps, you still have areas of hydrilla infestation despite such turbid waters. So we know that light infiltration may prohibit growth, but it won't be able to completely remove the hydrilla from, gro uh, from growing in these areas. We carried out some basic experimentations with hydrilla, and the purpose of the experiment was to see whether hydrilla would be able to survive the drying of the dredge materials, and whether they will still grow after being dried out. It's important because knowing whether or not they dry out and whether they die out it can limit what can be done with the dredge material. And we can determine if treating for hydrilla in the dredge material would be actually necessary. So desiccation is basically the dehydration of an organism. And we just looked at how they would dry out over, the t over time periods and certain given conditions. We dried out stem fragments, the turions, and tubers of hydrilla. When we looked at stem fragments of hydrilla, we looked at different conditions that it might be buried in or incorporated into the dredge material. So we looked at different uh, viable lengths of fragments, which are five nodes and 10 nodes. We looked at different depths, and we looked at different conditions in which, in which it might be buried. So whether it was completely buried or halfway buried. Now we dried the uh, sediment out for a week, and then we sieved out the fragments and rewater them to see whether they would show signs of vitality. The results that we got were, unfor unfortunately, we were, I mean, we were hoping for a result that would basically wipe out the hydrilla because literature did suggest that hydrilla dries out rather quickly and they die out. However, if you look at this, you can basically see that in all conditions of any type of treatment, nodes, or depth, except for hydrilla that were attached at the surface and completely exposed to the atmosphere, we had some of these samples survive. And since we're looking at extinction of hydrilla in these areas when we treat them, this shows that we can't rely on just dehydrating the material and hoping that hydrilla will go away. So we, this shows that some other form of treatment will have, have to uh, be applied together with desiccation. And another thing that we wanted to note was that when hydrilla was dried, we took stem fragments that were in single lines, so we didn't have these growths to the side. And however, when we rewatered them, and they started growing turions, and then some new growths started coming out to the side. And this might be a potential stress response where the hydrilla shows, uh, retains basic biological functions so that they can survive in harsh conditions. And then when they meet more favorable conditions, like a new water body that they can grow in, they might start growing again. So, once again, this is important to realize because we know that if we try to have the dredge material come in contact with any water bodies without properly treating for the hydrilla, we will have new growths coming in. A similar experiment was carried out with curions, except we didn't look at the uh, relationship to sediment drying, but we looked at different times of drying with curions. Curions are <coughs> Wintering buds that are basically reproductive bodies for hydrilla. And what we did was we looked at free floating turions and turions attached to short stems and looked at how they would dry out and rewater. And what happened with the turions was none of the turions actually grew any more than its original state so after uh, dehydrating and rewatering. However, they did retain shape, they did retain coloration, so they looked like, it looked like a lot of them were actually surviving the drying conditions. So we know that not all existing trions will sprout after drying, but it's also important to note that some of them will survive. And something that should be noted with the dredging project is that hydrilla, mon uh, monoaceous hydrilla in the Ithaca area will sprout trions during late August to October, and this was uh, what was observed this year. So any kind of dredging projects that involves the spread of materials, we'll have to make sure that it doesn't coincide with this time so that we can prevent hydrilla spreading. We only found one tuber in three 20 liter buckets of sediment, and this was the amount of sediment that we collected for the uh, actual experiment. 
Now, in some sense, it might be a good suggestion that there might not be that many tubers growing, so it might have less potential for spreading. But at the same time, we dried this tr uh, tuber out for a week along with the fragments, and yet when we rehydrated it, it sprouted perfectly fine on its own. And it shows that drying can actually induce growth in tubers because they can survive long-term times of uh, drying periods. And since our goal here is complete removal of hydrilla from the, uh, the materials, it, this might not be such a desirable condition for us at the present uh, situation. So if we do need to remove hydrilla from the dredge material, what would, we, what would we actually need to do? If the dredge material is distributed over multiple locations like roadside fills, the possibility of hydrilla spreading actually increases. So we have to make sure that the dredge disposal is local and contained so that we can control the hydrilla and make sure it doesn't spread any further. And to ensure that pro uh, proper control, we require a monitoring management plan where we look over the dredge material and continuously check for hydrilla growth over time. And then if the hydrilla do grow back, we'll have to carry out proper treatments as the situation requires, and then repeat the process of monitoring and treatment. One potential dredge management method that uh, the alternative section after this will treat a little bit more in depth is the division of dredge material into uh, separate cells for detailed control and dehydration. So if we have different cells of dredge material spread out over a given location, then we can look at the area, we can monitor it, and we can make sure that any hydrilla that comes up can be properly removed. There are multiple ways of treating hydrilla, uh, including physical removal, desiccation, chemical treatments, and whatnot, but we wanted to look at primarily potential treatment methods that we could uh, incorporate into the dredging material uh, project. So one method is looking at physical removal. In this case, we're looking at aquatic removal, where the diver in the picture is using suction dredges to suck out hydrilla from the soil, and or using rakes to collect the hydrilla and basically remove the hydrilla physically. Physical removals are good because they can be target specific. We can go after the hydrilla as we monitor them and as we see them, and we can combine this with the monitoring process. But given that the upper limits of dredging right now might be 670,000 cubic yards, this is extensive manual labor and it requires a lot of time and it just might not be cost effective. Another method, desiccation, was the method that we looked at, but and like we showed, it doesn't require much manpower. It's basically letting the material dry out so that the hydrilla can dry out and die as well. But once again, it can reduce the hydrilla count, but it can't eradicate the hydrilla count. So it's difficult to confirm removal, and it will really be dependent on soil water content. Two more methods that we thought of looking at were chemical treatment and solarization. Now, we, the hydrilla in the uh, inlet area have been sprayed with apothol K, and they have been, we have tried, uh, the city has tried to remove the hydrilla permanently using alcohol K. Unfortunately, there's signs showing that hydrilla right now is coming back after the chemical treatment. So it's, it once again shows how difficult it is to properly spray the entire area and once again demonstrates how important it is to have a controllable area that we can properly spray under given conditions. So spraying, for example, if we were drying out the uh, dredge material in a terrestrial system, we could spread ra spray Roundup in the entire area and make sure that everything in the area dies out and then have the Roundup dissipate so that we can use the soil for other methods, other means. It's very efficient in control settings, but once again, alcohol K, Roundup, and all these other chemicals are, do, are toxic, so we do have to watch out for potential toxicity, and it requires a lot of monitoring. But once again, monitoring isn't a bad thing given that we want to make sure that Hydrilla is completely gone, and any kind of undesirable weeds are gone from the area as well. It might be costly to spray the entire area, given, once again, how large the dredge material is going to be. Solarization isn't something that you associate a lot with hydrilla, because hydrilla is an aquatic uh, vegetation, and as any farmers might know, solarization is using um, sheets of polyethylene to basically cook the soil beneath the, the solarized areas. But if given that if we dry out the dredge material in a terrestrial system, 
the hydrilla will also be in a terrestrial environment. So what we can do is we can basically cover up the soil with these sheets. And the optimal upper levels of hydrilla uh, of temperature for hydrilla reproduction and survival is thought to be at uh, approximately around 35 degrees centigrade. With solarization, if we basically spread the sheets out and cook the soil underneath it, the temperatures will go up to 60 degrees centigrade at depths of two feet and 40 degrees centigrade at depths of even 16 feet. So if you can spread the cells out nice and thinly, it can actually help with aeration, which goes back to methane control, and control hydrilla and any other undesirable weeds that might start growing up in the area. So we can basically cook the hydrilla alive and make sure that they completely die out before we start using the soil for other means. Of course, this will require lengthy monitoring, but given that the dehydration process for dredge material is going to require years as well, this could be a very nice combination of methods to make sure that we don't have hydrilla spreading around other waterways. And with that, I'll pass on the baton to. Words. Um, so I'm going to go over um, a variety of um, options, including uh, making some sort of industrial product out of the sediment, um, creating a um, some dry or upland sites, um, new land out of um, out of the sediment, or using the sediment in the creation of new wetland zones. Um, so uh, first, uh, there's the option of making a synthetic soil. Um, this is something that uh, Hayden had been alluding to earlier. Uh, we do have a bit of a wacky uh, nutrient profile on this sediment, but uh, if we end up combining it with um, some compost, which could be available from either Cayuga compost or possibly um, Ithaca Brewing, we were thinking, since uh, Budweiser has a similar operation um, going to use up all of the it's beer leftovers. Um, we thought that you know we could have about uh, 9,000 um, tons of organic matter available to mix in with the dredge material, um, which would then um, one dilute down any of the um, oddities in the in the dredge material, and then create um, a sellable product as well. And depending on how much we dredge, you know, there's different amounts of um, product available for sale. Um, other uh, options for products um, include uh, brick making, lightweight aggregates, and cement lock. Um, there is a successful example of um, brick making in, that exists in Germany um, where they're using uh, dredge sediment as a partial replacement for uh, the clay and sand content in bricks. Um, and there's also been studies done um, by Georgia, um, Georgia University to um, completely replace the, the sand and clay content in bricks. Um, so we, we could go into that business here at Ithaca. Um, there's also the option of a lightweight aggregate. Uh, oftentimes sediment can be used in uh, CMUs or concrete, asphalt, various construction products. Um, unfortunately, um, <laughs> we're not going to be producing quite enough dredge material for that. Um, the, the processing facilities um, to make that are generally a lot bigger um, maybe handling 10 to 100 times the capacity um, that we will actually have here um, in Ithaca. Um, so then a, a third option would be cement lock, um, which requires a much smaller facility to make, um, and actually it transforms a uh, dredge material into something analogous to uh, Portland cement. Um, so that could be a great product. The downside would be that we'd have to build a factory for it, so that would probably increase our costs quite a bit. Um, now I'm going to talk about a few different um, options for um, either disposing or not disposing of, but moving the dredge material to um, upland sites or the creation of new dryland areas. Uh, this, um, this project in uh, Dryden you've seen a couple times already, um, but we went out there with the class, you know, it's leftover from the uh, Lake Source Cooling Project. And um, basically what we found is, you know, it didn't turn out so bad. 12 years later, um, you know, things are, things are growing even where we, you know, had all of this dredge put down. You know, it just looks like a field. It's, uh, it, you know, maybe we're not getting anything terribly useful out of it, but things could be worse. Um, so, you know, one option that we thought we could perhaps um, 
take all of the, the dredge sediment out and redistribute it across the county. Everyone can get their fair share and um, put it out in their lawn or something. Um, perhaps I, if, you know, trying to get a bit more use out of um, the dredge and in a more practical approach than trying to find that land um, up county, um, out in the county to put this on. Um, it's a project out in Buffalo, New York, uh, where they also had a, a canal that needed to get dredged, um, also an industrial use corridor. And um, they ended up uh, creating a, a controlled um, disposal facility or confined um, where they deposited all of the uh, dredge material um, out in a, in a spot along the lake um, and created a new, new bit of land, which is now actually a 50-acre um, nature, uh, nature preserve. Um, so, oh, and then a similar project um, was done in Cleveland, Ohio, um, same idea, um, where they you know, created a, a very controlled um, edge on, on the site, I slowly filled it in with uh, dredge material, and again, they, their project is larger. Um, I believe 88 acres. And um, now that is, again, also a nature preserve. Um, this is actually a pretty common practice, it turns out. Um, there are, let me see, 45 different confined um, facilities throughout the Great Lakes for, um, for using dredge material or for con con containing it and controlling it. Um, so if this is something that we'd be interested in doing in Ithaca, we'd be in good company, and there's a lot of different example projects to look to. Um, the way that they created um, both the Cleveland Project and the Buffalo Project, um, you can kind of see here, well, they started by building um, a perimeter out into the water, um, which then was slowly filled with dredge sediment until you start actually getting um, some buildup of, of solid land um, out into the lake. Um, this has also happened much closer to home, right here in Stewart Park. Um, used to be a wetland marsh area, and you know, as Rebecca talked about in the beginning, uh, we've been having dredging going on in in Ithaca for at least 100 years. And um, you know, some of the the first uh, notes I found of uh, Stewart Park, where they were starting to reclaim the land in 1911. Um, and this kept going on throughout the decades. Uh, this plan in uh, 1934 called for um, adding another two to four layers of, or two to four feet um, in a layer of, of sediment um, added across the park just because it was, um, it was just too marshy and swampy f to be enjoyable for anyone. So um, you know, now this may be seen as perhaps a loss of wetlands, but at the time this was really um, seen as a very good beneficial project um, to keep out um, all the you know, undesirable flooding and, and other problems that um, the city had been having. Um, pretty much the same story goes for Cass Park. Um, it, the, the dredging and building up of it got started a little bit later and that didn't really get finished until the um, 1970s um, after the flood control channel had been uh, cut out. So what that ends up leaving us with is um, Ithaca's got a lot more dry land at the at the southern tip of our lake than a lot of our uh, sister cities uh, do, or some of them aren't cities, but just our, our sister finger lakes here, where the, which um, generally the natural state is to have wetlands in the, the southern edge of the lake before it starts. Sediment carries on and moves upstream and exits out the north. Um, all right, next I'm gonna talk about a few options for um, possibly creating a wetland type situation uh, with the dredge material. Um, dredge material, as has been said many times tonight, is already going into the lake. Um, so this would be not adding extra material to it, but rather just you know, controlling um, how it gets deposited within the lake. Um, a few years ago, there was a project proposed um, by Rick Manning and Fred Cowett um, which just tried to look at taking dredge sediment and um, getting some, some ecological services and benefits out of it. Um, so what they proposed, um, you can see here, is um, 
a new wetland created right off the western edge of Stewart Park, uh, right up here, um, which would slowly uh, get built up over time. We could probably do this in a similar way as um, with the Cleveland and Buffalo sites. Uh, so it would be a contained, controlled edge. Um, and you know, you could start providing more habitat. And um, the other benefit could be actually, um, with the new findings on hydrilla, um, actually controlling uh, the potential spread of hydrilla by keeping all of the sediment on site um, rather than spreading it out across the county. Um, now this could actually be, be hindered by the hot off the press draft um, environmental impact statement that, that just came out uh, where they're trying to completely, you know, never have any of this uh, dredge sediment um, re-enter the lake be in for fear of uh, the hydrilla returning. But I guess we as a class felt that um, keeping this all in one spot would make it a whole lot easier to manage than if we start, you know, either selling this off as topsoil or in some other way um, spread the, the dredge material across the county, the state, wherever. So. Um, some, um, some legal uh, issues and possible funding sources actually. Um, in, in 1992, um, there was um, a law written saying that uh, for navigate, if uh, dredging needs to happen for navigational purposes, um, then there could actually be um, some funding available for the creation of um, new ecosystems. So this could be pretty great if we actually wanted to go after it. It looks um, you know, more research would have to be done, but um, it appears that there could be up to $5 million available of federal money for the creation of uh, wetland aquatic habitat uh, for the use of this dredge material. Um, and then this graphic just shows uh, the depletion of wetlands over time. Uh, so it's down in the, you know, in the green areas is where wetlands were furthest back in history. And um, as we go through yellow and orange, that's kind of what, what is left of them. So it, it could be really great actually to bring some of that habitat back into the Ithaca area. Um, Poplar Island is a project down in the Chesapeake Bay that we went and visited as a class. Um, you know, this is also actually very similar to the, the Buffalo and Cleveland projects where um, there had been an island here um, in, in 1847. It was a thousand acre island and then by 1994 there was only four acres of it left. The whole thing had just sort of disappeared. But they needed to do a dredging project to get into Baltimore Harbor and so they decided to rebuild the island. Uh, this has been a really giant project um, involving lots of different agencies on all kinds of different uh, political levels, but uh, it's been successful actually. So it, again, even as a, both as a how to get it done uh, physically and politically, this could be a good model for Ithaca if we chose to um, try and keep our, our uh, bridge sediment within the water. Uh, let's see. So yeah, so after the, uh, the edge containment um, was put up there, with the, like with the Cleveland site, um, they filled in with, uh, with dredge sediment and now they've got some very viable wetlands um, existing there and all of these um, animals are, have been coming back to the island on their own. Um, that really, they haven't been introducing any of them on purpose, but it's, it's looking pretty good as a, uh, as a viable new habitat. Uh, another group of people that we talked to while down in Maryland as a class uh, were from Living Shoreline. And uh, what they worked on was uh, trying to stop erosion ha from happening right on the, the banks of, uh, in this case, the Chesapeake Bay. Um, but this could be a, a really helpful thing for us in Ithaca, because especially right along where the flood control channel is, um, you know, oftentimes there's really only a thin strip maybe three feet of, of scruff between the water and, and the lawn. Um, so a lot of sediment and erosion can happen that way. Um, so what the people at Living Shorelines did, actually I think it's on the next slide, um, they will actually cut the, the bank back so that it is a much more gradual slope. And then they're able to plant it up with, uh, with wetland plants. And that keeps, uh, more sediment and erosion from happening, which will hope, hopefully keep our um, 
problems from getting worse in the future so that we don't have to be dredging quite as often or quite as much in the future as um, we're looking at right now. Um, one issue that has been brought up about possibly putting um, any sort of wetland project uh, like the, the manning Cowett proposal in Ithaca is, well, we've got this um, seasonal change of water level because of the dam that's at the north end of the lake. Uh, the water level actually changes by three feet. Um, so we looked at Montezuma National Wildlife Refuge up at the north end of the lake. Um, this is a 50,000 acre wetland preserve. Um, and that has a natural, natural fluctuation in water level and you know, has been doing just fine. So uh, we think it's you know, something that we could definitely manage to get away with here. Um, and, um, and this actually also, just interestingly, ha was a uh, reclaimed, restored wetland as well. Um, it had been drained in 1910 uh, when the canal was brought in, and then they restored it in 1937 with, uh, with work from the CCC. Um, and then, um, again, another close to home example, uh, this is Watkins Glen, Queen Catherine Marsh. Um, this is actually a, a naturally occurring Finger, La Finger Lakes wetland. Um, right here in the, in the light blue, well, right up here is Watkins Glen. And then here in the light blue is uh, where the, the glacial layer in the dark blue is where uh, the existing Queen Catherine Marsh wetland is. Uh, this is a thousand acre wetland um, operated by the New York uh, <coughs> DEC. And um, this is still actually dredged um, from time to time for navigation and flood control purposes. Um, it's a really great recreational opportunity for people who live there. And um, you know, it could be something perhaps Ithaca, Ithaca could be envious of. Um, so just to sum up, um, you know, once we get done with uh, the actual dredging process, uh, we're real, the whole, you know, that's not it, but this isn't over. Um, we can't really, well, we could just make this out of sight, out of mind, but uh, the dredge material really has the potential um, to be uh, of quite a bit of value and shouldn't be considered a waste product. Uh, so for a few last final thoughts, I'm gonna pass it back over to Ben. Okay, thank you all for your patience. It's uh, the end of our presentation here. Uh, we definitely have quite a bit of people to thank. I think most of the room is on this list. <laughs> but major the message is that we couldn't have done it without you, all this work and learning. And I'd like to thank you for all the hours and time that you put in, all the late night emails respectfully returned. Um, it's the end. <laughs> and just as a closing note, um, we hope we provided you with a lot of helpful information about this project. Um, hope you picked up on these key messages that we re repeated throughout. Um, we definitely have a lack of maintenance going on here. This isn't a problem that's going away. Uh, the last 50 years there's been deferred uh, dredging in the lake and we're feeling the consequences of it now. As well as the natural process. This isn't something that, you know, human activity is necessarily created, um, but that is on top of an already occurring process that would be there whether or not we had taken away the wetlands in the uh, early 1900s. Um, that should be addressed as well. Um, and I know there's a headache on a lot of levels, but it also provides a lot of opportunities that we can take on into the future. Um, we've presented a lot of different productive ways of managing this dredge material. As well, um, this is a chance to efficiently plan for the future. I mean, this is 50 years we've accumulated, you know, 660,000 cubic yards of dredge material in this inlet. We can get rid of it once, where are we gonna put it the next time? It's gonna happen again and again. We need to take that in consideration and then come together, because this is a unique opportunity to bridge a lot of different agencies in order to uh, increase the innovation methods. So we'd like to open up the floor now to questions and we'll answer them the best we can and uh, facilitate a discussion about this. Nobody jumped to <laughs> you in the front row. I'm a lakefront owner, and I'm aware that we're not allowed to make new land into the lake. So, did you, your 
project look into any of the legalities with the various agencies where you'd have to get permission to make a new Definitely, one? yeah. I mean, Matt could speak a little bit more. He did the reference about the um, Army Corps, the Army Corps um, funding. However, just out of base level, um, we know we've gotten a lot of encouraging messages from speaking with the Army Corps, and given the examples that we saw in Cleveland and Buffalo, um, we definitely think it's look, worth looking into um, in terms of not just a watershed uh, habitat, but also in terms of the commerce, you know, there's, there's, it's been done before, you know, it's, it's not something to um, completely write off. In some of the earlier scoping documents, looking at alternatives, various sites, um, including deep water disposal or the creation of, of new lands, as you're indicating. As far as we understood, the, the message from the Department of State was that that's an alienation of public, uh, public trust, I guess, the waterway itself. Um, we haven't found the legislation that says that. So it, it, sounds, it sounds like policy. Interpretation of policy. Um, this Army Corps legislation, this um, Water Resources Development Act, Section 204, re beneficial reuse of dredge materials, looking at doing just that, taking these systems that are feeding systems. Um, there's maintenance issues, obviously, of navigability and flood control concerns, and understanding that it is a process that, that the lake itself, I mean, all those marshes that we showed before, you know, those were open open standing water previous and you know, long geologic history obviously wetlands themselves are accreting systems um, so I we put the Army Corps legislation in there as an opportunity it, it may not actually be an option but it seems something that you know through a couple of phone calls or emails or trying to get meetings between these various agencies and different levels of government could potentially still be an option even though it was one of the alternatives that was sort of viewed as not feasible in the earlier scoping documents. We haven't really had a chance to look at the draft environmental impact statement since it came out just a few days ago when we were getting ready for tonight. Just a follow-up comment about that is the 660,000 number that we've been throwing around is a, from what we understand, an Army Corps estimate of if you removed all the sediment from the inlet that would be the amount that would restoring the original, restoring the original configuration. Bottom. Yes? Are there any ongoing projects <clears throat> that are coming out of this, your work or this study? Ongoing projects? Um, well, we still haven't finished the report we're going to put together <laughs> next week. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Will your report and uh, this PowerPoint and things like that be available online somewhere eventually? Yeah, definitely. Um, Contact person for that is um, Brian Eden. <laughs> yeah, well, I haven't talked to Tom. We were, you know, planning to have it up on some uh, site, but uh, I'm not clear exactly. It was going to be a Cornell site, or it was going to be one of our sites. Yeah, I'm not sure either at this yeah. time. This yeah. is the we have to get it down to size so that it's not 12 gigs. Yeah, well, there will be copies of it around. There will be DVDs of the proposal, and we'll probably give you 10 of those or so. Or yeah. so yeah. It will be available. Uh, I, I think your study is really good and a fantastic job for, for a class. Thank you. Uh, but if you look at the southern end of Cuba Lake, you've got another elephant in, in the room, and that is Fall Creek and all the sediment that's coming up that doesn't go into the inlet, but goes just in front of Stewart Park. And so how long is it going to be before the end of the lake is going to become a wetland? Because of all that sediment that's coming in as well. So it may not require the department of so-and-so to legislate, no, you can't, or you can. Sure. It's yeah. going to happen by itself. Definitely. I mean, so we if that's the case, then aren't we saying the next time we dredge, well, we'll just add to what's already formed there. That's, like I said, we didn't look at Fall Creek for just for that reason. We had to found our system sure. in, in looking at the uh, project. But though that earlier uh, Coweth Manning proposal was building up basically, you know, 
defining Fall Creek as it exits uh, through Stewart Park. Um, you know, if something were constructed there, like you said, there's a lot of sediment coming from Fall Creek, and a wetland there would probably trap some of that sediment as well, which maybe has a maintenance issue in itself, but understanding that it is this natural process and having the opportunity to, that the options of, of either just letting the inlet itself accrete versus letting a little bit more out into the lake accrete. I, I think the concern of wetlands generating on their own is, is on a time scale that I don't know, I can't really wrap my head around that in terms of uh, us still worrying about boating activity. But um, as a larger management regime and maintenance issue, understanding the whole hydrolo hydrologic process of sedimentation, including Fall Creek, is probably something that, that would have to be considered. Yes? I'm the manning of the Oh, great. Great to meet you. I should take no responsibility or credit for that. Um, it was really Tom Niederkorn, like in the mid 80s, did a Stewart Park plan that was okay. kind of panned in the community. Um, and Charlie Troutman, who was now the director of the Science Center, did a lot of studies of how um, the sediment would be pushed further by that finger and kind of dispersed further out in the lake. And, um, so I think there's a lot of and I thought Fred did a really nice job of kind of designing that in the studio context of what that sure. what that could look like. And um, I really do think it's a great opportunity. And it has, I guess, just doesn't seem to be feasible according to DEC and or Army Corps current regulations. But it, it doesn't seem to be a sensible um, decision to me. I think, it's a, I think it is a real opportunity. And it was, it's nice to see it there. And it would be worth fighting for, but I'm not sure how it's been tried a lot, I think it hasn't been successful, but um, through, through the whole ecologic and the dredging environmental impact process, but I think um, there is a Stewart Park plan in the 80s that I, you may have seen, and I have a copy of it, if anyone's interested in the studies that were done. I think it's pre-computer, pre so they kind of use manual studies, but to see how the sediment would flow from Fall Creek out into the lake get further away from depositing right in the vicinity of Stewart Park. So um, it's a, it was an interesting <clears throat> moment that um, really Fred kind of played out in the, in the context of the studios. Sure. Just two points about that before the next question. Um, if you looked at some of the earlier imagery, you see, you know, I don't know if you could follow up on it. The, the, the sediment plume is just, it's visibly coming from the inlet Six Mile Creek complex and not so much the Fall Creek. And Fall Creek coming along mm -hmm. the south of Stewart Park, hitting the breakwater and sort of, like you said, circulating around there. It doesn't seem to be, we didn't use the, I didn't look at the model numbers for sedimentation coming from the Fall Creek watershed because it wasn't part of our system. Um, but that's, you know, the opportunities that this study has looking at hydrilla alternatives and considering some of these other methods and things that are already out there that could be used has a lot of potential. But also the second point, you said, uh, you know, you haven't spoken with anyone from the state or these other agencies. Throughout our process, we didn't, we also had, didn't have a chance to speak with people at DEC or the Department of State, but we spoke with um, the gentleman from the Army Corps who works, I believe, in the Buffalo region. Huh? His office is in Ithaca, yeah, I believe. Yeah. Um, and he, his mentality, mentality was encouraging. He's the one who informed us of this beneficial reuse legislation. But it seems like the, uh, the earlier question I was trying to answer is, you know, it, it's a potential and it may just be a matter of getting more than one agency in a room at a time. Um, but we didn't have that opportunity. Yeah, and just to reinforce a little bit of that, I, I concur with some of the thinking that was done study and beyond, but it seems like it has been stonewalled by this aura of, you know, DEC and Army Corps saying, no, you can't put the stuff in the lake, it's, you know, public domain mm -hmm. or whatever, and yet didn't, didn't I see in your presentation there were 40 such projects in the Great Lakes? In the Great Lakes, yes. 
I mean, obviously different different state jurisdictions. <laughs> I just wanted to respond to an earlier comment. You know, the reason that uh, the sediment from Fall Creek, even though it's not as significant as that from Six Mile Creek, there's this uh, process called the Coriolis effect. You know, particles in suspension move counterclockwise. So the, the Fall Creek, since it doesn't have a, does, uh, it moves very close to the shore in that effect. And with the prevailing northwest winds, it pushes right into the shore. And if you've gone by, the uh, maintenance building at Seward Park or by the large pavilion, you'll see large amounts of debris that have been pushed in there uh, because of the prevailing winds. And uh, they periodically have removed that, but the last time they removed so much that they actually removed part of the uh, sediment uh, in the, the lake bed itself and were fined pretty significantly. Yeah, I think this okay. image kind yeah. of represents that. You can see it when you're out there. You can, I mean, this is a flood condition, obviously. You can see the water up over the edge of the park here, but where that breakwater hits, the water just spins around. Any other questions, comments? Yes. Um, earlier in the report, um, I saw where uh, part of the study said if, if you use the dredge material and you, it's my understanding, to make topsoil, you could make topsoil out of it eventually. Okay. And one of the low numbers of for X amount of dredge material you get eight hundred million dollars worth of topsoil. Is anybody doing that? With I mean, is that like so there's a corporation that does that and they're making all this you know, making eight hundred million dollars. Hayden, you wanna feel yeah. that? Uh, I don't think the number was quite eight hundred million. <laughs> but um, I think uh, there are, I found an example of a place in Michigan that does take um, kind of dredge material and kind of fill, and they mix it with compost and do sell it as a usable product. Um, we don't know exactly what the numbers would be based on the kind of geo that we get. Um, we were just kind of trying to give a ballpark range for what Topsoil sells for. And with the numbers that we're getting, it, I think the high end was like two million total. Um, and there's also issues with how much keg, we used keg compost and cornell compost um, to get just kind of a general like, number of how much organic fat we have locally. And Cayuga, I think it would, have, it would be an issue. We would, I think the town might have to come with some agreement with buying off their compost or figuring all that right. stuff. So the numbers are a little iffy, but there has been um, precedents in the past of people using a material that isn't quite ready, mixing with organic matter and um, selling it. Yes. Um, I, I guess with full disclosure, I work for the city of Ithaca. Um, I have a question about your hydrilla desiccation study. Um, did you consider how long it would take to uh, inactivate the tubers? Because that's the real concern, not the, the vegetation. Well, with the tubers, a seismic fact that we didn't have enough specimens for a proper experiment. Right. The other issue was that we were expecting the tubers to last for a really long time. Uh, other literatures from Florida, where they had di uh, diaceous tubers, um, diaceous hydrilla, and from Carolina and these other areas where they have monoaceous um, hydrilla. Tubers have been shown to survive for basically anywhere from two to five years, and, and under dry conditions too. So they can basically regrow if, they, if they're dry for three, four years, and then they pull it back into water, then they'll grow up again. So it's something that we, wanted to talk about in more detail, but we just didn't have the uh, time over the semester. To so I, I don't know if you know this or not, but the city did draw together all the agencies and talk about the dredging project in light of Hydrilla. Um, and that is the major concern, is how it's going to add to the holding time necessary for the material. Um, so if your next class, I guess, or as you're writing it up, comes up with some good ideas, please let us know. And my follow-up comment um, and hope, I guess, is that you will try and share this information um, with the city on the, the recent document that came out. Take advantage of that public comment. Yeah, definitely. We're planning on submitting to the uh, by the 16th. Get Great, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Cool. In addition to the hydrilla tube survival, um, is there a viable seed bank in this material, or is it just too anaerobic? I mean, that was when we did the, uh, the rarefaction curve for the dried site. 
that was one, they had very different um, species in the threaded material and in the old field. We're not sure if what the exact cause from that was. There's different rates of runoff in the threaded material. It's made a different, um, it's like a different type of soil. But there could be a seed bank um, in the area. Um, but we're, that's, we can't, I don't think we have enough information to answer definitely on that. But it's a distinct possibility. Um, but it would be um, seeds from the drain area. Because where the, the sediment is coming from, kind of like the surrounding uh, banks from the creeks that run up into the watersheds. So, so is there a use for a like that? Um, I don't know. <laughs> you have a question? Um, if the opportunity to create a wetland in Perry's Lake didn't happen, um, you mentioned that all this dredge material will be placed behind Lowe's. That yeah, that's the current. Um, that's the plan. That's the plan, yeah. There's a site back there. Um, what's that habitat like back there? Is it like a grassy area or is it a field? Sure. We'll yeah. kind of talk about it, but maybe if we you know, trip on our toes, you can. Correct it's, just a, it's just a holding area. Yeah. It can't stay there because of that picture you have of the uh, football field. Right. Yeah, it can't stay there. So that, it wouldn't be possible to spread it out and kind of like... That, that 20 acre work. site would be a staging area for different processes of the dewatering. Okay. Uh, ultimately, their plan is to confine it to a permanent eight, eight acre site for future dredging maintenance. Um, and then you know, the, the site, the remaining 12 acres has potential for something else, but that that still doesn't answer, you know, where's the, once it's been dewatered, de -watered, where's the, the sediment, the dredged material go? We're also talking about separating the sand out as part of the process. Okay. You spray it out, sand goes out further or something, so you end up with material less. Different types of materials, yeah. yeah. So through, the, through that, it's, you know, four or five cells at different stages of the process, you can try to extract different um, sand silt clays for, for different uses. The land area isn't going to be used to create any sort of nature preserve or habitat. Because, I mean, if you can grow even invasives or non native plants in it, it still becomes a viable habitat for like shrublands. Sure. Yeah. Animals. It's partly, I mean, in the past it has been used as. Uh, a disposal area for construction material. Yeah, there's uh, the point also is that there after that, what next? You know, how much space is there on the inlet to put this? And in the future, where where is it going to go the next time? Yeah. All right. I would just add that I think the future of that site is quite uncertain at the moment. There yes. Was, there was a lot of planning that went on over the past twenty years that kind of led to the idea that. consider uh, flood control further up the creeks? Meaning uh, sort of in-channel interventions? <laughs> or diversifying the channels, marshland, wetland, sure. sediment ponds? Um, I mean, ex an example of that is the, the silt pond just before the 60-foot dam is intended to uh, do just that, remove some of the silt as to prevent clogging the dam, which actually is now in the process or soon to be dredged itself to increase capacity because of the decision to keep the city on its own water supply. Um, I think one of the issues with that is the understanding 
the in-stream and the, the channel bank and just the geology and the fact that it, it's, you know, it's, it's varying layers of solid and fragile and trying to do some sort of uh, structural things uh, and altering the, the, the gorges themselves. They're pretty incised when they're not incised, meaning, you know, steep banks, low water flowing through. Uh, you have the channelized portions through downtown. Um, I can't imagine there would be any permission to do alterations with the flood control channel itself. Under Army Corps jurisdiction, there's requirements for um, maintaining the lawn directly adjacent to the to the riprap embankment. Um, we didn't we didn't look into that. Um, I'm talking about above the gorges. Or in the inlet oh, land land inlet side creek. practices up. Okay, I see what you mean. Or in the inlet creek, uh, you've got the railroad, which is a barrier and channelizes the water. There are a lot of to at least slow and, and start the accretish, accretion process further upstream. No, we, we hadn't, we didn't investigate. We did talk briefly about using Home Depot and Lowe's and Wegmans as a site for reinstating floodplain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that is, that's one, one kind of, <laughs> you know, we have to re-clean Catherine and Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> we have a pretty, we have flashy watersheds around here. Shallow bedrock, shallow the Fragipan, and runoff rates are pretty fast. It doesn't take, we didn't show our infiltration studies here, but it doesn't take very much rain to get runoff. So, uh, you know, half an inch of rain, we can have the water come up and down in the space of eight hours. And that's really difficult. To deal with using physical infrastructure, unless you're literally trying to turn it into the lower Mississippi or something. So, we've kind of built ourselves into a corner here by virtue of having um, eliminated so much of our natural floodplain in an area where the where the velocities are slowing down and where sediment does fall out. So, our degrees. Of Yes. Question built on that. Since we have eliminated our floodplain, we have built all this up, including our sewage treatment plant down there. Uh, any thought into using this material to protect some of that, you know, creating more berms around these? Uh, so when these floods, like the picture you had a minute ago, um, when they happen, our water, our sewage treatment plant isn't six feet underwater. Sure, we had um, top flows, the whole area is not underwater. Very early on, it, I think I broached that with Tom and he re reminded me that that's even further disconnecting us from the, the floodplain, uh, trying to create dikes and or levees. And obviously that's something that you know you could do with the material, but it, it might exacerbate uh, the situation. So glad to see those. Well, if, big if, you, boxes if you look at the uh, the, <laughs> uh, the sewage treatment plant, kind of neat. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the accessibility that we found for this material is very low. Right. So if you were to try to build up in any sort of berm, uh, once water hit it, it would just kind of slump around. Right in in the drying so, process, could that be dealt with though? If it were to stay dry, it almost forms like a concrete. But once you mix it with water, then it kind of returns. But you don't have enough clay. It's a low, we do have some clay, but it tends to be sandy and silty. So we really need more clay to both increase the aggregate stability, but more importantly, from the standpoint of building levees out of it, we want something that would that would hold water, you know, literally. So something that would have a very low hydraulic conductivity under saturated conditions. But that's that's a that's a thought. We did talk a little bit about maybe raising the datum of Inlet Island six feet or so to accommodate this new development that everybody's pushing for. Um, but you know, there there are a number of alternatives that could be considered, but they have to be based on careful engineering studies and probably modifying the material. I think we um, well one more question, and then we're gonna have to wrap it up. It's gonna be time.
Yes. In your alternative description, did you take a look at which alternatives might be mutually exclusive or which could be used in combination? Um, that's a good question because, like Peter said, looking at the different areas of the dredge material, there's definitely different, you know, in Cascadeal Creek, there's a lot more hydrilla. Maybe that section should be managed on a different basis. Maybe it should be zonal. Um, and that's definitely open to suggestions. I mean, we provided a healthy amount of alternatives, but which one is most apt for which situation, that's definitely a discussion that could and should happen. The alternatives are both spatial and temporal you know you do one thing at one time then you come and do another thing potentially at another time it's we're not going to dredge up 660,000 cubic yards in one year especially considering the dewatering site is is only capable of handling 80,000 cubic yards so um, I mean one of the things that we hoped we could do was present a lot of alternative ideas thinking slightly outside the box coming up with you know this concept of maybe breaking it up and understanding that the dredge process versus the, the clamshell versus the hydraulic, you're gonna have different conditions. Um, just trying to reintroduce that into the conversation perhaps um, and uh, basically raise a lot more questions, yeah. I would say. And hit as many problems with one process as once, you know, layering one, like Peter said, might, you know, kill the methane. So how do you layer these processes to create the biggest uh, how long would effect? It take to dredge out all that? Well, I think the rate, the current rate the city's estimated is the most that they could possibly dredge in one season would be 80,000 cubic yards. I think that's the number that we read. And not the hydrilla season? Not the hydrilla season. So, yeah, I don't know if that includes the hydrilla season or not. Okay, well, I want to thank uh, the students uh, for coming out into the community. <laughs> This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.